start. It's already 12. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Axel Rose today, our distinguished speaker. So Axel studied in Freiburg and then for a long time was in Cologne, actually 15 years, where he did uh, uh, his postdoctoral studies and also worked as a doctor and after this he moved to Dresden where he currently holds the position of Director of Institute in Immunology and his main interest was for a long time studying the, um, the mechanism how innate antiviral immunity is developing, what is the mechanism and how they can fail and lead to the autoimmunity and I hope it was right. <laughs> <laughs> and also, the, um, his another area of interest is the mast cell biology, and they developed very useful models which clarified a lot of issues about mast cells. Um, yeah, it's my great pleasure to to welcome you here, and to and we are all expecting an exciting talk and a nice discussion afterwards. Please welcome. Okay, thanks a lot for the introduction and I'm really honored by the invitation. Okay, um, so chronic inflammation, I don't have to mention in front of this audience that chronic inflammation is one of the major uh, um, health problems of today's medicine and, and um, if one next to cancer, perhaps the most important and if one considers that that also arterial sclerosis is to a large degree also an inflammatory problem then can also consider cardiovascular uh, um, um, diseases, immunological diseases and then that um, um, clarifies the dimensions of, of this uh, problem. Okay, um, just to, to start out uh, very broad, I mean you know of course very well that our immune system has two parts. There's the, the innate immune system, our first uh, line of defense uh, that recognizes pathogens, invaders, but also it detects uh, a cellular stress and cellular damage um, by uh, a set of, of germline encoded uh, pattern recognition receptors. And uh, this uh, part of the immune system to which basically all cells of the body can contribute. Um, these uh, innate responses innate infl in, in, initiate inflammation, which somehow um, keeps the uh, invader in check. Um, and then it's of course extremely important that this inflammatory response here is essential to activate the adaptive immune response by providing danger signals that activate dendritic cells um, and to make them fit to uh, activate T cell responses and then uh, it is important to be aware that uh, the adaptive response, the, the effectors of the adaptive response like helper cells and antibodies, they to a large extent, they, their effector function is dependent <coughs> on the innate immune system because what they do is they, they activate the effectors of the innate immunity and they direct them onto uh, their target, let's say a microbe or infected cells. So the two parts of the, in, of the immune system closely interact and um, I would like to start out saying that there's quite a number of diseases which are caused um, basically by the innate immune system alone with, with hardly any contribution or no contribution by the adaptive immune system. And I just would like to show you some examples of this. Um, this is of course, as you know, is called auto-inflammation. In the old times, basically any inflammatory, chronic inflammatory problem was called autoimmunity and today we know of course better and call these diseases which are um, um, in, uh, uh, caused by, by a purely innate problem, uh, auto-inflammation. And an example uh, are for example uh, um, the cryopyrin associated auto-inflammatory syndromes which are due to an overproduction of interleukin 1 and they are due to um, mutations in this pattern recognition receptor in the cytosol um, 
and these mutations lead to an aberrant, uh, a, 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 a very low threshold for activation of the inflammasome formation, and then IL-1 activation. And uh, this is very severe symptoms, inflammatory symptoms in various different organs like skin, joints, and also here this is a stare and this white here, uh, white signals, uh, this is uh, uh, steroid meningitis. And so this is, uh, these are very severe conditions. Um, the, the problem might also root in metabolism. Um, it might not be uh, mutations, need not be mutations of components of the innate immune system itself. For example, as you know, there's gout. Uh, caused by, uh, two, uh, by, by excessive uh, uh, levels of uric acid, which then forms crystals in the tissues. And the important thing here is that um, the, these crystals, they induce a massive inflammatory response, which is extremely painful. And uh, uh, this inflammatory response is completely dependent on this inflammasome formation. Uh, and so this is basically also an auto-inflammatory um, a process, yeah. So, and here this is to remind me to not forget arteriosclerosis, um, which, to a large degree, is also dependent on on an innate inflammatory response, also um, triggered by inflammasome forming sensors. Um, um, and it's a response to the cholesterol crystals, yeah? analogous to the uric acid crystals. So the, the innate immune system can make us very sick. There's a lot of other inflammatory, auto-inflammatory conditions, like here the lack of um, our endogenous IL-1 antagonist. Uh, this syndrome is called DIRA. It's also a very severe condition. There's also uh, auto-inflammatory problems resulting from um, excessive uh, um, effects of, of uh, TNF. For example, TRUPS is, is one famous um, representative. And there's many um, auto-inflammatory conditions where we are quite sure that their nature is auto-inflammatory, but uh, um, where we don't know how they are initiated. And, and a very impressive example um, that I will never forget from my clinical period of, of clinical work is pyoderma gangrenosum. Um, this is um, a problem that arises from an abnormal activation of a neutrophilic granulocytes and they basically melt away the tissue. Yeah, this starts as a, as a small pustule um, in otherwise completely normal skin, small pustule, and then it grows into a small ulcer and then this ulcer grows into a big crater. Every day it's a, a centimeter bigger, it's extremely impressive and um, this is just to, to illustrate the, the destructive power that the, that the innate uh, immune system uh, has. So this, uh, I mean, to, to do exome sequencing on a few hundred of these patients, that would be something that is, I think, really very attractive. Yeah, okay, and then um, autoimmunity is, of course, defined as a loss of tolerance in the T-cell and B-cell system. And... Um, there's of course no, there's no, nothing like pure autoimmunity because you always need some contribution of the innate immune system. There's some conditions um, uh, where the adaptive system causes damage without much contribution by the innate system. For example, myasthenia gravis, you may know. This can result from a point mutation in the acetylcholine receptor gene resulting in somewhat reduced expression of acetylcholine receptor in the thymus and therefore compromised negative selection of T cells specific for, the, for this receptor and therefore you have, we have an, an autoantibody formation against the acetylcholine receptor uh, which blocks here the, the uh, signal transduction at the, at the uh, 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 neuronal muscular interface and this results in the muscle weakness disease, uh, myasthenia gravis. So, so this is something that is almost completely within the adaptive immune system. But of course, the manifestation, um, you inherit this mutation, but the manifestation often is after some kind of viral infection. So you need also some innate trigger to, to, 
initiate then the, the actual manifestation. In most cases, um, autoimmunity um, also uh, in, involves um, 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 an important contribution um, uh, of innate immunity. For example, autoantibodies formed uh, by after a loss of tolerance in the B cell system, they decorate some some host cells, which are then destructed, um, destructed by complement or by K cells. Or so the two systems um, very intimately uh, um, interact to to um, re result in in, um, in chronic inflammation. And and uh, what I would like to talk about now in more detail is. Um, um, diseases where an aberrant activation of the innate immune system um, is actually the trigger for the loss of tolerance in the adaptive uh, system. And um, one group of diseases where this seems to be prominently the case is um, diseases which are also well known to this audience, the, the autoimmune connective tissue diseases, collagenosen in German, uh, systemic lupus as the flagship, but also dermatomyositis, um, a very impressive disease. With, if you see that in the clinics, you will never forget it. Um, if this inflammation process, which primarily affects the skin and the muscles, but if this affects also the lung, then the patient has a high risk of dying of this condition. Um, and then there's systemic sclerosis. You may know this condition with um, uh, uh, the, the dermis, the, the, the collagen layer of the skin getting too uh, thick and uh, the skin gets too tight and uh, causes a lot of very nasty problems and there's Schilgren syndrome uh, which is an autoimmune attack against the, um, uh, um, uh, uh, the saliva glands and, uh, and causes dryness of the mouth uh, but um, it is also a systemic, uh, inf a systemic uh, disease, which is systemic vasculitis. It's a complex disease also, and these diseases they are they are all related to each other. They're intimately related, despite these very distinct uh, phenotypes, and um, but they share key uh, features, key biological, biochemical features, and um, two of the most important features that are common to all these is that um, they all have these anti-nuclear antibodies so antibodies against ubiquitous self antigens which are mostly located in the nucleus and um, I would like to point out as you will know that uh, these anti-nuclear antibodies while well, all these patients do have them um, the different entities here are associated with different anti-nuclear antibody specificities. Yeah? So in lupus, we typically have anti-nuclear antibodies directed against the double-stranded DNA or against histones. And here in these scleroderma patients, there's a milder form of scleroderma. These patients have autoantibodies against the centromere proteins of the chromosome. Other scleroderma patients have autoantibodies against, so they're clinically distinct and they have a massive association with a different anti-nuclear antibody which is directed against topoisomerase 1, so this enzyme which relaxes coil of DNA. And, uh, and for example here we have an autoantibody in a subset of these patients uh, directed against an RNA sensor, MDA5, several DNA repair enzymes. Also here, this is associated with antibodies against DNA repair enzymes. So what I want to say is this: these are very bizarre phenomena, which we know already for some 20, 30 years. Yeah? But uh, it's, it's completely unknown how this, uh, uh, what, what are the reasons for these uh, um, very reproducible uh, uh, immunological phenomena. And then the second thing is, this, uh, all these diseases have um, a spontaneous activation, chronic activation of innate antiviral uh, immune responses. So they all spontaneously produce, <coughs> patients spontaneously produce type 1 interferon. Um, 
So this is from a, um, a famous paper by Jacques Bonchereau and Virginia Pasquale. Um, these here are the SLE patients, and these are controls here. And uh, these red genes, they are all upregulated type 1 interferon inducible genes, yeah? showing you that there's a type 1 interferon transcriptional signature in the serum of these patients. And this is highly reproducible and is more or less independent of um, the disease activity. Also, in a, in, a, in an SLE patient with only moderate or no um, um, disease activity at the moment, you sample blood and you will find uh, um, a type 1 interferon a signature. So, um, all comprehensive models for pathogenesis, pathogenesis for these conditions, they must incorporate these, uh, these phenomena um, autoantibodies against nuclear self structures and um, a spontaneous activation of the type 1 interference system in the absence of any virus infection that can be causally linked to these conditions. Yeah? People have been looking for a virus infection that causes these problems for decades, but uh, there was no, no clear link uh, um, of any of these diseases to some, and uh, that would explain this antiviral immune response. So why, why do these patients spontaneously make this antiviral immune response? And um, as you know, interferon responses are induced by detection, uh, are mounted against virus infection and are detected uh, by, by detection of viral nucleic acids, their RNA or their DNA. And this is by a, a set of, of nucleic acid sensors. As you know, there's the nucleic acid sensing toll-like receptors in the endosome and uh, like the RNA sensors TLR7 and 8 and TLR9 senses DNA and then there's RNA sensors also in the cytosol, Rig I and MDA5 and there's uh, DNA sensors in the cytosol uh, this enzyme CGAS um, which upon binding of double-stranded DNA produces CGAMP the second messenger, which is then sensed by steam, uh, and, uh, and which then activates here the interferon uh, response. AIM-1 is a double-stranded DNA sensor which activates an inflammasome and IL-1 production. And um, it seems that much of the problem in these uh, lupus and, and the related conditions uh, is that these sensor pathways, these different sensor pathways, get aberrantly activated by our own nucleic acids. Not by viral nucleic acids, but by our own nucleic acids. The principle here is, of course, uh, why we have a, a DNA sensor in the cytosol for the detection of virus infection, is that the cytosol should be a compartment which is entirely free of double-stranded DNA. And therefore, um, this uh, sensor here uh, um, makes sense. Um, much of the problem seems to be due to the fact that these sensors um, have only a limited capacity to discriminate between our own and viral or microbial nucleic acids. Um, so it's a, prob a problem of, of self, non-self discrimination in the innate <coughs> immune system. Toll-like receptor 3 is not so bad. The ligand for toll-like receptor 3 is, is long double-stranded RNA. And that is something that really uh, mammalian cells don't have, and so this, is, this sensor is not a problem in this respect. But these two here, uh, they can basically not at all discriminate between self and non-self, because the actual ligand for TL TLR7 and 8 are very, very short oligonucleotides, few nucleotides only, um, uh, um, plus um, single uh, nuclear monomeric nucleosides, uh, like guanosine or, or, or uridine, and um, so these are degradation products of RNA, and, and there's no basis for any self, non-self discrimination. TLR9, you know the CPG motive uh, business. There's some limited self, non-self discrimination, but uh, it's very clear that uh, TLR9 activation by our own DNA uh, can make us very sick. Rig I and uh, MDA5 are not bad in discriminating between self and non-self, but CGAS and AIM2, these DNA sensors in the cytosol, 
they uh, get perfectly activated by any DNA. There's no sequence specificity, no self, non-self discrimination at all. Um, now, um, I would like to say something very trivial, but still very important. Many chronic inflammatory diseases are multifactorial and, and polygenic, meaning there's not one cause of lupus, but very many. And uh, there's an environmental contribution, and there's a genetic contribution, and the genetic uh, predisposition um, is, is basically um, um, uh, the sum of very many disease-causing gene variants that exist in the population and in the individual patients. So in the population there's hundreds of, of genetic variants of very many different genes which can predispose to lupus development and, um, and the individual patient has a certain selection of, of these uh, uh, disease-causing variants. And so we must be somehow humble and, and um, understand all these different disease <coughs> mechanisms one by one. And um, one important uh, um, disease mechanism in SLE, which has already been understood quite some time ago, um, is, is this one here. Um, it is the, the activation of autoreactive B cells um, and, and also dendritic cells by nucleic acids from uh, cellular debris, from dead cells. Um, let's assume this is a histone-specific B cell, for example. Um, so uh, chromatin debris can, in principle, um, 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 uh, histone protein, this, this uh, blue thing here, can be um, um, recognized by such an autoreactive B cell and it will then internalize uh, this complex um, DNA is bound to the histone and in the endosome TLR9 will get activated and thereby the B cell gets two activation signals um, which can uh, uh, get, activate the B cells actually independent of T cell help and that is then um, that leads to the formation of uh, an anti-nuclear antibody, in this case an anti-histone antibody. And uh, the, the chromatin material uh, is then trapped in, in immune complexes which are taken up by dendritic cells and also the dendritic cells get an activation kick by the nucleic acid component um, of these uh, self-antigens and uh, they then fuel the immune reaction by, by producing type 1 interferon. Also the B cell can produce type 1 interferon upon sensing uh, the nucleic acid. And, and the reason we do not all do this uh, and, and produce anti-nuclear antibodies and, and, and uh, mount a spontaneous interferon response is that we have very efficient means to uh, get rid of cellular debris, chromatin material, for example, we have a very strong DNA activity in our serum and um, um, we have very effective means of, of disposing of uh, dead cells, which, uh, for example, involves complement. Therefore, defects of complement receptors are uh, a very strong genetic, uh, predisposing uh, genetic lesions uh, for SLE. Um, now, that is one mechanism um, that has been understood already for some 10 years or so. Now, I would like to talk about this very rare syndrome, icardi Gutierrez syndrome, very rare, can be considered a monogenic variant of SLE um, because there's clinical similarities with SLE and uh, like SLE, these patients have uh, anti-nuclear antibodies and have a spontaneous activation of the type 1 interferon system. And this, is, this syndrome is so interesting because it illustrates um, several different molecular mechanisms, how a chronic pathogenic type 1 interferon response uh, can get activated. Um, the gene genes, uh, um, the defects of which can cause this rare syndrome, Icardi Gutierrez syndrome, uh, are these here. One defect in one of these can cause the disease. Uh, one is here the RNA sensor MDA5, um, where Icardi Gutierrez causing mutations were found to be gain-of-function mutations. Yeah? So you have a gain-of-function mutation in MDL5, you constitutively 
produce Taiwan interferon <coughs> and it gives you this lupus-like disease. And then there's this fascinating case of ADA1. This is actually an RNA editing enzyme and it was recently found that um, this enzyme modifies our own RNA, edits our own RNA to hide it from MDA5. If you don't have ADA1, you activate MDA5 by, the, our, our, by your own uh, um, RNA. And then these three here are all nucleases, intracellular nucleases. And uh, so we, I mentioned DNA is one in the plasma. Um, so that is nucleic acid waste removal in the extracellular compartment. And this here is nucleases in the cytosol. Um, really truly within the cells and a knockout of one of these tracks one it's actually a DNA also called DNA 3 um, this knockout was really uh, very instructive um, it was made by Tom Linder um, more than 10 years ago and these mice developed multi-organ inflammation and actually die of this multi-organ inflammation and um, these animals also have a spontaneous activation of the interferon response, as Ruslan Metsitov uh, then found. And when they were crossed to a type 1 interferon receptor knockout, um, then these animals are completely protected. So these are the uh, TREX1 knockout animals, and, and these are TREX1 knockout animals um, without a functioning type 1 interferon receptor. So they are completely rescued, there's no pathology at all, and so the whole thing is, um, is completely type 1 interferon dependent. And it's also lymphocyte dependent because if you cross these animals to, to rag uh, mutants, then also there's no disease at all. So it is um, a problem, a type 1 interferon, of type 1 interferon driven autoimmunity. Um, so this is the current state of the art in, in Icardi Gutierrez syndrome. I, I mentioned here. MDA5 gain of function mutations and ADA1. This activates uh, chronic RNA uh, sensing and uh, type 1 interferon responses. And as you can see here, sting, um, sting, chronic sting activation via the DNA sensor CGAS is caused by the loss of TREX1. Because if you take away uh, CGAS or sting or TBK1, then um, you rescue the TREX1 knockout phenotype exactly as you rescue it with uh, uh, the knockout of the type 1 interferon receptor. And this led to the idea, uh, this is a, the current concept, is that if you don't have this DNAs, then you accumulate some nucleic acid waste in the cell. We don't know the nature of this nucleic acid. But this nucleic acid is a ligand for this double-stranded DNA sensor CGAS and thereby chronically activates this interferon response. And the big question is, what is this nucleic acid? Where does it come from? So what, is, what kind of nucleic acid waste must be continuously degraded in cells to prevent spontaneous activation of the interferon uh, system? And there's several uh, uh, hypotheses on this. One is um, that that these icardi gutier associated nucleases, like TREX1, that they continuously interrupt the, the replication cycle of endogenous retro elements, yeah, like endogenous retroviruses or line elements, um, which, as you know, populate our genome. There's a large fraction of our genome is actually encoded by these. Um, very ancient uh, um, retro elements which can um, be transcribed, some, some copies of these can still be transcribed, um, reverse transcribed and then integrate somewhere else in the genome so they can, can undergo some a copy and paste amplification in our genome. And um, there was the idea that you, you need TREX1 to degrade replication Re retrotransposition intermediates of these endogenous retro elements. Yeah? And um, there's actually a paper saying that if you treat these TREX1 knockout mice with anti 
retroviral drugs, <coughs> reverse transcriptase inhibitors, then uh, you, you would cure their disease. That is, of course, very exciting because it would say that you can cure autoimmunity by suppressing um, retroviral replication. And um, we were also very excited by this and we uh, invested quite some energy to, to repeat this and to, to treat TREX1 knockout mice um, with reverse transcriptase inhibitors. But as you can see here, um, so these are the treated mice here, the, uh, uh, these are the, the red are the untreated, the green are the treated mice, and we don't see any effect. We tried various different regimes and, and we found no, not the slightest effect of this treatment. Yeah? And uh, we also asked whether one can perhaps in the absence of TREX1 uh, see um, an enhanced retrotransposition activity of these retro elements. Uh, we tried several different models um, that allow quantification of retrotransposition events, and we didn't see any uh, any uh, enhanced uh, retrotransposition activity in the absence of TREX1. So we can't exclude that this this hypothesis is, is true, but uh, we have not been able to produce any any evidence in support of it. And, and now we turn our attention to a second uh, attractive hypothesis. And this is that this nucleic acid waste, DNA waste, may originate from DNA repair. You know that nucleotide excision repair, for example, works by um, excising um, a, a flap of DNA that contains a lesion. Yeah? So here's a lesion. And uh, this nucleotide excision repair pathway um, just cuts out the piece of DNA, which can actually be quite long, um, um, which is then released, and then you, you uh, polymerize here and fill up this gap. And, uh, and the question is, what happens to this flap? Yeah? And it could it's quite uh, plausible that such flaps might, might actually be ligands for nucleic acid sensors. Um, in particular, the Hartmann group in Bonn have shown that um, they have analyzed the, the um, ligand requirements for CGAS, so the sensor that, does the, the, that causes the problem in, in TREX1 deficiency. And they found that you do need a double-stranded DNA, but the double-stranded uh, segment can actually be very short. It can be as short as 12 nucleotides, provided that there's single-stranded overhangs which contain Gs. If you have this, what they call Y DNA with Gs and these overhangs, then this efficiently activates uh, CGAS. And the idea would be that such flaps here they could perhaps randomly hybridize and and uh, produce a CGAS ligand. Yeah? And um, yeah, uh, we 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 made um, a condition. This fit fitted quite well to, to a finding that we made with our conditional <coughs> knockout mice. Yeah? So we, we, um, we knocked out tracks one in different cell types to find out where must this happen, where do you have to have this lack of tracks one um, to induce systemic autoimmunity. Yeah? And we, we knocked it out in the gene we knocked out the gene in several different cell types like dendritic cells using the scree line by from Ketano by Sintuta's lab. And we found that this indeed does cause a lack of TREX1 only in dendritic cells causes, um, is enough to have uh, systemic autoimmunity. Also in some other cell types like macrophages. Um, but when we knocked out TREX1 in B cells, there was not the slightest effect. Yeah? B cells don't seem to notice at all that they don't have uh, TREX1. Yeah? I, I can't go into much detail, so this is the absence of interferon response, and this is here a transcriptome of, of um, TREX1 deficient and TREX1 competent B cells, and uh, there's basically no, no difference. These few genes here, they are all encoded in the congenic interval uh, surrounding the CD19 3 knock in, so these are basically strain differences and not, not a real difference between TREX1 uh, deficient and, and uh, competent. So B cells, in principle, they are capable of sensing DNA in their cytosol, but still, you take away tracks one, 
this accumulation of this nucleic acid waste does not seem to uh, occur. And um, we got really excited when we found this paper here, which claims, I don't know whether that's true, um, that B cells don't do nucleotides, don't do global nucleotide excision repair. And this paper says that B cells only do um, transcription coupled nucleotide excision repair, focusing only on the actively transcribed genes, but not global nucleotide excision repair. And that we thought, well, that would fit so well, and maybe this is the explanation why B cells don't um, um, respond to the lack of TREX1. And um, so we, we thought the best would be to make mice which in addition to TREX1 are deficient for nucleotide excision repair and knocked out XPA. And we used uh, um, CRISPR to do that and uh, actually we, we designed uh, two guides per, per, per gene. So two gui uh, guides in the TREX1 gene and two guides in the XPA gene and injected uh, these into oocytes and uh, we got, we got um, uh, 40 offspring, and of these 40 offspring, 10 were by allelic tracks knockout. And um, of these 10, 4 actually were also by allelic XPA knockouts. Yeah. I mean, in this building, one does not have to emphasize that CRISPR is really amazing, yeah? But I mean, this result, I mean, we just tried to do this. We didn't have much hope, but we were absolutely blown away by this result. And so this mouse here, just to, as an example, so this this has no biotype sequence. So this is NGS sequencing of, the, of these mice, and so no biotype allele for XPA. So tracks, tracks, tracks is knockout on both alleles. XPA uh, no biotype sequence <coughs> and one allele which has an uh, 11 base pair deletion here at one of these CRISPR uh, guide binding sites and um, another allele which has um, an, in, an insertion of two bases at one of the target sites and uh, a 30 base pair deletion at the other. Well, yeah. it may be standard for you, for us it was quite uh, breathtaking that this works so nicely. But then this was fine technically, but biologically it was a great disappointment. Because when we then looked at the spontaneous interferon response of these double <coughs> mutants, yeah, does now the lack of XPA abrogate the spontaneous interferon production? And the answer is unfortunately a very clear no. Uh, so these are, are here, um, these are uh, control mice, and the um, um, transcript levels of these three type 1 interferon inducible genes of so the control animals were set to 1. And in uh, relative to these control uh, levels, uh, if you knock out tracks one only, we have um, a massive increase in, in ISG expression. So there is indeed, also after our CRISPR knockout, a spontaneous uh, uh, in interferon response. But if we knock out XPA, in addition, this is not reduced. Yeah? So clearly, we don't need nucleotide excision repair to mount this spontaneous interferon response, which is a pity, but uh, now there's of course some several other possibilities, there's other repair pathways which can also uh, release uh, DNA flaps, which we will now look at, like the idea maybe long patch base excision repair and some others, and there's also the, the idea of uh, that uh, maybe uh, this nucleic acid waste does not come from DNA repair, but rather comes from uh, DNA replication. Uh, you know that lagging strand synthesis um, um, uh, involves the priming of Okazaki fragment, fragment by an RNA primer. This is here, this yellow thing. And then follows a short stretch of DNA um, that is actually uh, done by an error prone. DNA polymerase, so this is a bad uh, a, a stretch of DNA which has a lot of mistakes. And, and the RNA primer and this first piece of DNA is then afterwards removed. Yeah? And this is a, a FAN1 uh, um, uh, uh, dependent process and um, involves the release of a flap which contains the primer here and some part of this DNA. And this is of course per 
cell division is an enormous number of such flaps that are being released, and maybe these are the um, uh, is the nucleic acid waste that activates the pathogenic interferon response. And we are now trying to uh, set up experiments which would um, which can test this, which, which is actually not very easy. So if I can summarize this at this point here, I hope I have shown you that there are several different mechanisms by which you can induce a spontaneous pathogenic type 1 interferon response. Um, this can happen by defects of, uh, of removal of dead cells and chromatin debris in extracellular compartments if you lack DNA1 for example or if you lack um, a complement, a functional complement receptors for example which predisposes to lupus. Um, if, you, if, you, if the extracellular compartment is flooded with chromatin debris then chromatin debris appears in the endosome in large numbers and is then sensed by for example toll-like receptor 9 and induces an interferon response. I have also shown you MDA5 activating point mutations can induce um, type 1 interferon response <coughs> lack of this RNA editing enzyme ADA1 uh, can induce um, uh, chronic interferon responses and then we talked about TREX1 uh, DNAs uh, in the cytosol which removes some nucleic acid waste, DNA waste we don't know where it comes from we don't think that endogenous retro elements are the source of this we don't know for sure um, uh, maybe um, this DNA comes from DNA replication um, or repair. And then um, I would like to stress that um, these mechanisms are not, not just something very exotic, uh, uh, important only in this very rare disease, Icardi Gutier syndrome, but these are mechanisms that are also relevant and contribute to the genetic, the polygenetic the polygenic uh, genetic predisposition to SLE um, because if you sequence a few hundred SLE patients then you find heterozygous loss of function alleles of these genes, TREX1 for example here in this paper um, uh, uh, in, in a significant fraction of patients yeah? so, so if you look at a few hundred SLE patients you will find a few percent that have uh, null, heterozygous null uh, uh, TREX1 alleles and that um, is, is very significant in comparison to control co uh, um, um, uh, cohorts and, and clearly says that uh, this, these pathways contribute to the uh, polygenic predisposition in sporadic uh, SLE. So monogenic Icardi Gutierre illustrates several specific pathomechanisms which contribute to polygenic SLE, probably also related diseases. Yet. And um, I hope that I showed you that the breakdown of self tolerance in the adaptive immune system can actually result from a failure of self, non self discrimination in the innate immune system. And um, the nature and source of the pathogenic nucleic acid in TREX1 deficiency is unknown. And um, finally, I would just like to say uh, very few sentences in general. So. These, these patients have this have spontaneous activation of the type 1 interferon response, basically all of them. Um, with varying intensity, the interferon response here in these scleroderma patients is not as strong as, for example, in SLE, and here it's extremely strong in, in, in the dermatomyositis patients. And these patients have these antinuclear antibodies, and it's important to realize that these antinuclear antibodies, they are the targets of these antibodies are always proteins which are in complex with nucleic acids. They are either repair proteins or they are enzymes like, um, like topo isomerase which form transient covalent complexes with uh, DNA or it's the DNA itself yeah? and uh, this uh, is certainly not a coincidence, but I think that it says that these targets, these proteins that are targeted by these autoantibodies, um, these proteins have an inbuilt adjuvant activity. They carry their 
if, if a cell, uh, um, if a cell uh, gets necrotic and, and the chromatin debris is, is released, and uh, it, um, it, if this chromatin debris is then um, picked up by an auto-specific B cell, for example, topoisomerase one specific B cell, then this B cell can get activated by the nucleic acid that is bound, the DNA that is bound to this enzyme. Yeah? And therefore, these enzymes are more uh, immunogenic compared to standard proteins, which are not in complex with nucleic acids. Yeah. And, and this, I think, is also the reason why these anti-nuclear antibodies are such so frequent autoantibodies, why, why they are so often uh, the target of autoantibodies. Yeah. And I think um, um, that that um, a big question is why why do these patients have these weird associations with these particular autoantibody specificities? Yeah. I think that this question also holds part of the key to the entire pathogenesis. Yeah. So why why do these scleroderma patients of only one disease subset, the milder form, why do they have antibodies against the centromeres of the chromosomes? I think that one uh, way one could look at this is uh, to ask, are, are these centromere proteins more tightly bound to the DNA? Um, or the topoisomerase, for example, in the other subsets of scleroderma patients, is this topoisomerase more tightly bound to DNA uh, in these patients, and these are ideas that we are currently following, but this is very uh, uh, prelim preliminary and too early to talk about that. Um, I would like to thank, uh, in particular, um, Ray Behrendt, who is a senior postdoc in my group, and um, many people who contributed to this, and many collaborators, and of course, um, I have to thank for a lot of funding. So, thanks for your attention. So now is it basically time for questions? Who would like to ask questions? Yeah, please. <clears throat> Could you speculate how chromatin or cellular debris gets from the endosome into the cytoplasm to activate CGAS? As it was shown yeah, on one of your slides. That's a very good question. <coughs> Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's a good question. So the point is, um, so I didn't mention, I, I forgot to mention DNAs2. DNAs2 is a DNA is in the endosomal compartment um, and it, it degrades uh, double-stranded DNA. And if you don't have DNAs2, you also develop um, an autoimmune disease, arthritis and, and in the mouse, it's a mouse disease. And it's not known whether there's something similar in the human. And, um, and this disease is clearly mediated by CGAS, by the CGAS sting pathway. If you take away CGAS or sting, then there's no pathology. But it has nothing to do with TLR9. And the, the reason is um, that TLR9 recognizes single-stranded DNA. And uh, to, to generate the actual uh, TLR9 ligand, you need a DNA activity in the endosome to produce very short oligonucleotides, which then dissociate, and then you have your single-stranded ligand. Uh, if you if you uh, don't have this DNA two, then you accumulate very long double-stranded DNA in the endosome. And how this actually then, and it, it's it's clear that it does get into the cytosol and activates the CGAS pathway. But how? It's not known. At least I I don't know. So um, you mentioned the T-Rex knockout mice when they don't have T and B cells, they actually don't get disease. But then at the same time, if you delete B cell or in B cells T-Rex one, so you don't see a phenotype. So at which stage, basically, the T-Rex deficiency modulates T and B cell responses? Yeah, that's. I mean, it's known that type one interferon is a driver of autoimmunity. If you treat patients with malignant diseases, this has been known for a long time, if you treat 
certain leukemias which are treated with type 1 interferon and malignant melanoma has been treated a lot with type 1 interferon and it has been known that uh, you run a risk of inducing autoimmunity yeah? and also a pre-existing uh, pre autoimmune condition has a higher chance of, uh, of flaring under this uh, type 1 interferon treatment and also there's transgenic animals overexpressing type 1 interferons they also get a lupus like disease yeah? um, I mean, type 1 interferon drives adaptive immunity, uh, enhances antigen presentation. This, but how exactly, how exactly um, autoimmunity results from too high endogenous production of type 1 interferon is not known. So is it like if you do it into for an alpha receptor in B cells or T cells? Would you be able to stop this? Or is yeah, the end, yeah, you would. Yeah. There's, there's actually, somebody has done this. Um, I think a T-cell specific deletion uh, ameliorates the disease con considerably. Yeah. But not in these cells. Uh, I actually don't, can't tell you. I'm sorry. Maybe. So, more questions? You, if I understood you correctly, you said that in the uh, T-Rex knockouts, the uh, um, tissue-specific ones, that if you knock it out in the DC compartment or in the macrophage compartment, then you uh, get the disease. But it didn't work in the, the, the T and B cells. And is that in B cells. T and B cells. And, and, ah, so. and is that also um, interferon dependent? Do you, d does, um, um, when you knock it out in the, the DCs, is, is there an effect on the interferon expression? Yeah, yeah. There's a spontaneous type 1 interferon response. <coughs> so in these, in these animals here, so these are the DC specific knockouts, and not all DCs, but a large fraction of certain DCs. Um, this is here the spontaneous interferon response. This is uh, ISG expression in peripheral blood cells. Yeah? And you can see it's really high. Yeah? So loss of Trax1 only in these DCs floods the organism with type 1 interferon. Yeah? And this includes uh, also PDCs. Is there a, is there a structure of this um, Trax1 available? Yeah. And, and is it clear that, that its only ligand is going to be uh, DNA? Yeah. That there's no alternative ligand, which would explain why you find it so hard to to get at the source of the uh, the, the, the DNA which triggers it. Um, well, I mean, can say so. The CDAS, CDAS cell <coughs> is absolutely, as far as we know, absolutely specific for double stranded DNA. There's no other ligand. Uh, described uh, for CDAS. And you take away CDAS, no disease at all, no interferon response. Huh? And uh, for TREX1, I can't exclude that there's not some, there's some, there, may, there might be also some RNA <coughs> species that can also be attacked by TREX1. Um, but uh, the RNA pathways are irrelevant. Huh? If you take away the RNA sensor pathways, nothing happens. So you still have this interference uh, response. You've mentioned that the double-stranded DNA in blood in serum is, is not stable under normal conditions. Yeah. What about double-stranded DNA in exosomes? Oh. Is that one of these potential answers that also contributes to the disease? Yeah. That that sometimes like the DNA's activities in exosomes differs between individuals. I, I, I have never actually thought about this. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe an important means to hide them from this new thing. I don't know. It sounds interesting. Yeah. According to your presentation, the T cells are completely out of the game. So. But some of the uh, autoantibodies are class switched, so this 
No, I don't say that they're completely out of the game, yeah. but, uh, but clearly you can induce such an ANA response in a T-cell independent fashion. Mm -hmm. The T-cell system for sure amplifies the whole thing further. But, uh, exactly, will it be sustained without T-cell support? Or will it just be a short-lived antibody production that then fades away unless T-cells get into the brain? <coughs> the, the, the nucleic acid oversupply mm -hmm. to the sensors continues. Continue. Mm -hmm. So I would say, <coughs> if you, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that it, it ameliorates the disease if you take away T cells, but it doesn't fix the problem. Yeah. If no further questions are, so you can always talk in person. And we would like to thank you for a very exciting and interesting talk.